the meeting is now live. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to your Public Works Committee. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Council Members Lee and O'Farrell. Mr. Koretz and De Leon should be joining us soon. Uh, I, I just spoiled the surprise again, Mr. Rastano, so would you please call the roll to officially get us started? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Council Member Lee. Present. Council Member De Leon. Council Member De Leon is currently absent. Council Member O'Farrell. Present. And Council Member Koretz. And it seems like Council Member Koretz is also currently absent. So that's three members and a quorum. Okay, great. Um, well, colleagues, we're going to move to public comment. Before we do, um, I want to telegraph my intention uh, is to recommend items three through six uh, for approval on consent and to discuss items one and two. But on those items, uh, there are going to be some recommendations on the consent items, uh, including for item three to adopt recommendations two through five in the Bureau of Public Works report dated December 15th. Um, for item four, adopting the recommendations in the Bureau of Engineering report dated January 5th, 2022. For item five, determine that the item is not a CEQA project as recommended in the City Attorney report dated January 14th. Present and adopt revised ordinance dated January 14th. Uh, receive and file the draft ordinance dated September 17th. And for item six is just to approve the motion. So uh, obviously anybody can call those special, but that's my intention. Uh, and I wanted the public to know that as well. Uh, and with that, I want to recognize Mr. Koretz has joined us as well. So we now, and Mr. DeLeon, we now actually have a full uh, committee. In fact, we should, should we do that formally, Mr. Espinosa, to mark them for the record? Or can I just tell you that they're here? Yes, we could call the roll one more time. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Council Member Bloomfield? Present. Council Member Lee? Present. Council Member DeLeon? Here. Councilmember O'Farrell. Present. And Councilmember Kurtz. Present. Five members and a quorum. So that uh, let's let's move straight into public comment. If you could uh, explain to speakers what the uh, process is and how to call in, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call one six six nine two five four five two five two and use meeting ID number. One six zero zero seven three two three nine seven, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Once again, members of the public wishing to speak, please press star nine. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon, Clara Kreger with CCA item one, please. Sure, you have one minute. Thanks. Um, we support the city's effort to create a permanent alfresco outdoor dining program, and we urge city council to make this program a priority so that departments can deliver the program quickly to support thousands of food and beverage businesses across the city. In addition to a more streamlined process for private property and sidewalk dining, we support continuing to safely allow outdoor dining in the public right of way to foster placemaking and activate spaces across downtown and the city. Also, given that the emergency program already exists, we ask the city to consider how it can reduce environmental review since environmental impacts are largely already known. Uh, we look forward to continued collaboration as this program is developed. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes. All the motherfucking items and general public comment. You have three minutes. Yes. So, you want alfresco doing it. What does that mean? Some kind of fancy foreign word. <laughs> so, it's uh, outdoor dining. Yeah. So, you humans want to go outdoors, like animals, <laughs> sitting out there gobbling your food, so people that are driving can look and see you stuffing your faces. I would imagine 
but you'd want to be indoors where it's warm and where it's cool in the summers. But no, not you people. No, you want to sit outside when it's 100 degrees and you want to sit outdoors when it rains. And for what reason? Why? Because uh, of COVID? Yes, and that's a good point. Thank you, Hume. This is a piece of shit, this whole thing. We want all of those things taken out of our right away so that people have cars and they can drive through. With one exception. What's that? Don't puppet will allow Kevin Day Lyon to have al fresco dining because he hasn't been an asshole this year. And so Goat Puppet will trust his judgment in Little Tokyo. Because Goat Puppet went through there, and they're managing their alfresco program very nicely. The rest of the city that does it looks like dog shit. <laughs> so we only support it at CD14. The rest of you, pack up, get off the sidewalks and streets, and open the goddamn road. <laughs> And then we get to solar lights. None of your solar lights work. You need to have batteries. You don't have the right batteries, so you can't charge and store your electricity. Your lights keep working and dimming. Now we'll get to the general comment. Do I have my minute? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I take it that there's no answer. Oh, that's Bob Blavin Boyle. Bob Blavin Boyle is denying services to his constituents. Today, Goat Puppet witnessed a truck that picked up items and left other items. <gasps> what? Yeah, the Department of Sanitation and Bob Blavin Boyle are playing games. They wouldn't take the four tires in the alley. Why won't they take my tire? I called bulky items, and they only took the wood items and not the tire items. Why? And I'm going to let Kevin Day Lyon investigate this terrible crime. The puppet moves that every homeless encampment be picked up by the Bureau of Sanitation Thank 30 you, days. Once again, members of the public wishing to speak, please press star nine. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Kayla Curding, and I'm speaking on item one and general public comment. Sure, you have two minutes. Perfect. Good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Kayla with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. Um, we support an expedited transition to permanence for the Al Fresco dining program in the city. Uh, the last 16 months have gutted California's restaurant industry, forcing them to implement costly safety measures, furlough employees, and even cease operations altogether. The city's alfresco dining program has been one of few bright spots during a challenging year muddled by ineffective and contradictory guidance released by the government. During this time of uncertainty, the alfresco program has rolled back regulatory bar barriers, allowing for flexibility, including curbside pickup, expansion of outdoor dining and food preparation, and even the fan favorite, to-go alcoholic drink. The program's relaxed parking requirements have helped restaurant, um, restaurant owners expand seating uh, into parking lots and streets, allowing restaurants to stay open, protecting food service employees' jobs, and ensuring that patrons can enjoy a safe meal while appreciating our city's mid-year, mild year-round climate. CD Alfresco Permanence will allow businesses to more easily adhere to ever-changing COVID-19 guidelines while expanding operations, providing a lucrative and safe solution to restaurants' economic and financial hardship. Further, growing permanence of the program will help the city address archaic parking requirements for restaurants, allowing rideshare, tr public transportation, and rapid curbside pickup to grow as viable alternatives to congestion. For these re reasons, we urge the council to continue protecting restaurants while allowing innovations to continue into the post-pandemic era by streamlining the permanence of al fresco dining. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last four digits, 7666, please press star six to unmute. 
Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, my name is Eddie Navarrete, and I'd like to speak on item number one in general public comment. Sure, you have two minutes. Great. Thank you. I, my name is Eddie Navarrete with the Independent Hospitality Coalition and continued support of item number one, Council File 200499, the permanency of Alfresco. We appreciate the work of LADBS and LADCB in putting this report together. It accurately identified just how lucrative and complex permitting for a restaurant patio has become. It also allows a glimpse of how impractical our current permit structure has become. Our hope is this work under these supported LADCP and LADBS recommendations may lead to further reevaluation of our permit systems, creating a more sustainable city staff work environment. It is possible to do more with less. Alfresco Dining has granted us the opportunity to reevaluate a regulation of outdoor spaces impacting our neighborhoods. It has become the ultimate pilot program for restaurants in Los Angeles, a great city with one of the best climates for outdoor dining. It has shown how we can build local ecosystems by removing parking in the communities and activating our streets by support, supporting small businesses. The reality is this ordinance will take time, and we do recommend some, conditions, some recommendations in the interim, uh, three of them. We recommend amending LEO Council File 20380S1 to allow the removal of parking requirements for patios permanently that do not impact existing parking stalls. Currently, LEO only allows for patios to be exempt from parking through temporary alfresco permits. Second, 20499, the EWDD recommendation number 5C, revision to the LA Municipal Code, Section 12.03 of the Zoning Code, to eliminate the limitation on outside dining, floor area, and location. And the third, we recommend, obviously, an urgency clause be applied once the ordinance starts the legislative process. We fully agree with the report that we will need to include both the private and public sectors working together to see the feasibility of this program. Thank you so much for your time, and I yield the rest of my time. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Randall Hernandez, External Affairs for Verizon, in support of item five. Sure, you have one minute. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members, I just want to simply recognize Ted Allen and the BOE team for their assistance on this particular item and for their ongoing support of the Verizon Fiber Bill across the city. And to you, Mr. Chairman, for your continued leadership and support of micro-trenching that we've been utilizing very effectively across the city. We're in full support of item five. Thank you. Once again, members of the public wishing to speak, please press star nine. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, yeah, I'd like to speak on item one, and I'd also like to speak on the lighting issue and public comment. Sure, you have three minutes. Okay, um, on item one, uh, I think that's going to create a lot of problems. Uh, I don't, I don't agree with making it permanent. Um, and um, the lighting item, uh, I think we already have a problem there. With um, we need to take care of the homeless problem first because they're out there. They're stealing from our lighting, uh, our fixture, our infrastructure. Um, it's. We need to take care of the homeless problem first before we start putting more lighting because uh, we're getting too much copper ripped off. Uh, it's, it's a disaster. Um, and my public comment is um, we have a private, uh, I guess what they're called is um, uh, private contractors, I guess, that they're digging up on our streets without putting the proper uh, notifications and this is in a residential area of what they're doing. Um, I called the temporary parking sign uh, department and they said that they didn't go through them to get the proper uh, no parking signs in the area for them to do the work. Uh, it's not being done properly. Uh, so it means that anybody can just go into our infrastructure and just destroy it. I mean, this is a safety issue. We need to really, uh, start taking care of that. I, I don't know why they're there or what they're doing. Uh, they're obviously having something to do with the gas company. So, and if there's an explosion and all those cars are on the street, good luck. And that's my public comment. Thank you.
caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, I'm Ruth. I'd like to speak on one, two, in general. Sure, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm an unhoused person. Uh, I live in public. Um, with the El Fresco dining, um, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of ambivalent about it. Like, I kind of feel like we invented El Fresco because, like, we eat every single meal that we eat and every snack that we eat outside. Um, and I can understand why people like this program, but I can't help but think it's the privatization of public space. By selling permits to set up on the sidewalk, the right of way, or in the alley or in the parking lot, you're offering restaurants something that unhoused people have never been offered, which is a chance to legitimize our right to use a small piece of public space. And so selling these permits to restaurants so that they may sit empty while their patrons fill up the outside, like, Where's the people that cry about um, people having to walk in the street because they can't pass or ADA clearance? Uh, these are common talking points you hear when people want to get rid of a tent on a sidewalk, but not an al fresco program. Um, yeah, but I, I would feel bad for the people that work in the restaurant that are trying not to get COVID. Uh, I think that being outside helps, but as far as having sympathy for the people that want to have an empty restaurant and the sidewalk, alleyway, and parking lot, I'm just, I don't know, I feel weird about it. Um, I want to say about the copper, the, uh, the lighting, number two, um, like I live somewhere that we had the lights go out because I guess the copper disappeared. And um, they've been out for, like, years. I don't know why they were even put in in the first place in a way that was completely, apparently, very easy for somebody to steal. And, like, there were no, um, I guess, like, they broke into these lights and were able to take out the copper without being detected by anyone um, on this path that we live on. So I think that they should have been solar to begin with. Um, and I definitely feel like um, we're being accused of stealing lighting. But, like, we are the ones who suffer the most when it disappears. Like, it's made our, our house like, a lot less safe because it's really dark now. And we would like them fixed, too, and we wish that they were solar in the first thank, place. Thank you, Call. Your time is up. And Mr. Chair, there are no more speakers on the queue. Okay, thank you. And thank you callers um, for that. Uh, so let's let's move forward then. Uh, as I mentioned, what I'd like to do is take items three through six uh, on consent. Uh, and I mentioned prior, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll mention it again, for item three, the recommendation is to adopt recommendation two through five in the Bureau of Public Works report dated December 15th. Um, because recommendation one is duplicative of recommendation two. And for item four, to adopt the recommendations in the Bureau of Engineering report dated January 5th. And for item five is to determine that this item is not a CEQA project as recommended in the city attorney report dated January 14th, present and adopt the revised ordinance dated January 14th, and receive and file the draft ordinance dated September 17th. And for item six is to approve the motion. So is there any objection to taking those items uh, as mentioned on consent. Seeing no objection from my colleagues, uh, Mr. Espinosa, if you would call the roll on those items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember De Leon? Councilmember... Aye. Oh, there he is. Councilmember O'Farrell? Yes. And Councilmember Corretz? Aye. aye. Um, five eyes, and these items are approved as you described. Great. Okay, so let's move uh, to item number one. Mr. Espinosa, if you would read that one into the record. Thank you. Um, item number one, um, 
our Department of City Planning and Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety. It's a joint report relative to transitioning the LA El Fresco program to a permanent program. And this item was also referred to the Transportation Committee. Great. And uh, before I, I turn to Mr. Pennington, just a couple of words. I mean, I'm excited about this. This is, you know, classic. We need to take the crisis of COVID and see where the opportunities are uh, and what are the things that we can adopt on a more permanent basis. So the program is meant to make it easier for restaurants to create outdoor dining. Uh, it's been a lifeline for small businesses, local businesses, when indoor dining was prohibited. But now, even now for folks, uh, it's making a difference in it. And right now, we can do it because of the declared emergency. But we need to create permanent rules to replace it, which provides an opportunity to take a look at all of our outdoor dining regulations in the zoning code and really try to streamline things. And there, there are three different types of outdoor dining, each with its own set of issues and rules. We've got outdoor dining on private property, which may or may not replace parking. We have sidewalk dining and dining in the streets. All are, are, are different. And the other thing before we get started, I wanted to, I, I'm gonna have some recommendations. Usually I read them at the end. I wanted to read them at the beginning first because I think there may be a lot of questions around these things. And if you know that these are the recommendations that may help uh, guide the conversation as well. So the recommendations at the end I'm going to uh, ask for in addition to whatever else comes up in discussion are the following. Instruct the Department of City Planning and the Department of Building and Safety to report back to council within 60 days with a status report and preliminary recommendations regarding outdoor dining provisions, including the following parking issues, including an evaluation of corridors with high concentration of outdoor dining and increased dining capacity in relation to parking availability and metrics that can be used to determine an appropriate number of additional outdoor dining seats, potential limits on the amount of on-site parking that may be converted to outdoor dining in order to achieve program-wide equity. Whether any limits, you know, also whether any limits should apply to patios that do not impact on-site parking or the number of percentage of seats that may be required without providing additional parking. Two, noise issues that the report includes, including whether different rules should apply depending on whether the uh, outdoor dining is on the side of a structure facing residential uses. Three, alcohol service. Four, feasibility of the program, similar to the restaurant beverage program that creates a streamlined approval process for applicants that meet a set of standard conditions and allows council members to include or exclude areas that are eligible for that program, basically building on that great model we did with restaurant beverage for Al Fresco. Uh, five, the feasibility of different regulations in different parts of the city based on factors like intensity of development, availability and use of transit modes, and other privately owned vehicles and on-street parking demand. And six, the enforcement of required requirements and conditions, including cooperation among the Department of Building and Safety, Bureau of Engineering, Bureau of uh, Street Services, Los Angeles Police Department, including ability to conduct inspections and enforcement during evening and weekend hours. Anyway, I wanted to put all that out there because, uh, you know, so we know that at least those are going to be my recommendations and we'll, I'm sure we'll have plenty more. Uh, and now let's move to our presenters. Uh, I see Mr. Pennington. Is it Paddington or Pellington? No, I'm just kidding. It, <laughs> uh, Andrew used to be on my staff, so I know him very well. So uh, uh, I was just playing with you there. So Mr. Pennington, why don't you uh, take it away? <clears throat> Uh, good, after, good afternoon, Honorable Chair and Committee Members, Andrew Pennington with the Department of City Planning. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Nicholas Marisich and Lillian Rubio. Additionally, Frank Lara from the Department of Building and Safety is here to assist with any questions from the committee members. Today, we'll provide a quick overview of our joint report done by the Department of Building and Safety and the Department of City Planning uh, regarding the creation of a permanent program for expanded outdoor dining on private property as a successor to the current temporary Al Fresco outdoor dining program. As a little bit of background, in May 2020, the mayor, through his local emergency powers, directed the applicable city departments to create a temporary program to allow for expanded outdoor dining. The program was created to assist local food establishments and restaurants who, at that point, had been subject to indoor dining bans and restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Alfesco program allowed qualifying food establishments to provide outdoor dining in both traditional and novel ways to allow for those establishment establishments to have an economically viable business model as the pandemic had constrained and discouraged indoor dining. 
The program waived most requirements and restrictions in the zoning code related to outdoor dining and provided new opportunities for these establishments to utilize space on private property and in the public right of way for outdoor dining, including existing parking spots. The program has been popular and more than 2,500 food establishments have taken advantage of the streamlined and cost-free program to provide expanded outdoor dining activities. Due to the popularity of the program and the persistence of the pandemic, Council has directed a number of departments to report PAC and in some instances amend existing regulations to create a permanent program for expanded outdoor dining. The department primarily regulates private property through the zoning code and the vast majority of participants in the current alfresco program are utilizing a portion of their private property for expanded outdoor dining. The zoning code permits outdoor dining in most instances for food establishments. However, there are a number of restrictions related to, related to the size of an outdoor dining area, where it is located on the property, and some instances restrictions on its operations. Furthermore, the zoning code prohibits the utilization of parking areas for outdoor dining or any use beyond automobile parking. The current Alfresco program encourages use of this space, however, as a viable location for outdoor dining. An amendment to the zoning code will be required to fully realize a permanent outdoor dining program in the same vein or similar vein as the alfresco program that currently exists. The city is uniquely positioned to reimagine and expand its outdoor dining opportunities due to its climate, environment, and the success of the temporary alfresco program. However, an effort of this scale will entail substantial research and community engagement to understand what zoning code changes are needed and to craft a program that blends into the urban fabric of Los Angeles. A number of issues will need to be addressed, including how a city-wide outdoor dining program will interact with existing specific plan regulations and site-specific regulations imposed on establishments with a conditional use permit allowing for alcohol sales. Additionally, the novel concept of allowing outdoor dining in existing parking areas will need to be further studied and analyzed to determine how to allow for its continuation while balancing the need for parking, safety, and equity. The department embraces the council's desire to see these expanded outdoor dining opportunities made permanent and recommends that the city council direct the department to begin work on an amendment to the zoning code to effectuate these changes, to incorporate a comprehensive outreach process and to further coordinate with other relevant departments to ensure that we create consistent regulations for out expanded outdoor dining, both on public property, as well as in the public right of way. These changes, if designed thoughtfully, will help provide permanent flexibility to restaurants and foster a more diverse streetscape and sense of community for many neighborhoods in the city. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to uh, present this and we are available if the committee has any questions or comments. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Pennington. And uh, are there any other departments want to add anything before we move to questions? DOT, BOE, Streets LA? No? Okay, then we'll just jump straight into to questions. Uh, a couple of quick things up front, and then I'm going to turn to my colleagues. Uh, what's the deadline for the city to have a permanent outdoor dining program in place authorized by permanent non-emergency ordinances and directives? Or is there a deadline? There really, uh, <laughs> there is really no strict deadline at this point. Um, the temporary alfresco program is still up and running and still accepting new applications. Um, it was extended until at least June of this year, and through the mayor's actions as well as council actions, it will wind down over at least a three-month period after the emergency declaration ends. So, at the earliest, if the local emergency um, declaration was rescinded, you know, this month, the earliest that we would have to have something in place would probably be fall of this year. Because I think it's important not to have a gap. Um, you know, we don't we don't want to be bouncing back and forth the regulations, we want to move smoothly to the next phase. So hopefully COVID, you know, obviously, if emergency keeps getting extended, we may extend the, the alfresco program, but let's operate as if that's not happening. Let's, let's hope that COVID's going to go away tomorrow. And then we're going to follow the, the guidelines and, and work toward that deadline. Uh, what are the major state building code issues that are going to hinder our ability to launch a permanent outdoor dining program? And what are our options as a city for dealing with those issues, uh, including but beyond uh, state legislation? Good, ap good afternoon, committee chair, uh, committee members, Frank Lara, Department of Building and Safety. 
Um, so as, as far as building code, um, I believe the biggest issue is going to be to address these the temporary structures that have been placed with most of the El Fresco locations. Uh, the anchorage um, uh, for a permanent structure, you have to have a, a permanent anchorage that that meets code. And also, um, you know, there's the uh, the combustible nature of some of the material that's used that would have to be addressed as well. All of these codes are um, they are authorized at the state level, so um, so the state would have to make you know any amendments to relax these kind of codes. We we don't have authority to um, relax codes here with a local amendment, um, but I believe. Um, you know, just the structure itself is the main is the main um, building code item. I mean, there's possibly increase in floor area that could could affect um, related to building code that could that could affect the size of the restaurant. But I don't think that's going to be a very big issue for most of these restaurants because of the size. Um, you know, there's currently outdoor dining that was pre El Fresco in many many restaurants um, and. Uh, many of them have shade structures that they built to be of a permanent nature. So I, I believe if if um, El Fresco is intended to be permanent, then maybe those structures should be, you know, have the durability to to last just like our our current uh, building code requires. But um, the structures themselves are going to be the issue related to the building code that would be the biggest hurdle. But couldn't we also we can we'll have some city options like. Couldn't we have temporary structures that are temporarily approved that don't, you know? So we we have we do have some current code, but they're, the duration is a very long, 180 days. Our, our, uh, in our chapter 31, 3103, we have temporary structures, but the, I don't know if the duration of time would, would meet the need. Okay, so that'll obviously be part of the proposal because it may, we may have to, we can't, make our proposal, our plan contingent on the state change right away, because that takes time. So we need to have in, in your report options of how can we continue this, even if we don't have those, um, you know, those state changes done. Uh, another question, do the departments and the bureaus need additional instructions and authorizations from the council beyond the recommendations in this joint report in order to continue moving forward with, the, with establishing the permanent programs? And on what issue is specific direction needed from us? Um, Lillian Rubio, Department of City Planning. Um, you know, we're looking into any guidance that the council could possibly give us so that we can conduct our community public outreach. Um, to the extent that the council has thoughts about the importance of certain provisions, it sounds like parking's one of them. Um, but I think with the recommended um, um, instructions you provided today could give us good guidelines. Um, but if there's any other um, you know, provisions you think that should be retained with current operators that are in the temporary um, permit, um, alfresco, then please provide those for us so that we can go ahead and address those during the public outreach. Great. All right, I wanna give my, I see all my colleagues have their hands up. So we'll go uh, Mr. Farrell, Mr. Kretz, and then Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Farrell, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Frank, and thank you, Lillian, for, for your report. Um, you just mentioned existing alfresco program dining establishments. So I think it's going to be really important that so that there is not a disruption into their ability to continue um, as they segue into a more permanent profile uh, of, of alfresco. So that, that's going to be really important. So I, I would love to see that addressed uh, moving forward as well. And then something else, um, whether it be a, a B permit or whatever way we do this, um, design standards are important. Uh, I've visited a number of other cities now and um, it looks like design standards are part of the program in other cities. Some of them have really, really great looking designs. And so just wondered, not to complicate anything, but we want these to be attractive spaces as well, uh, and perhaps design standards. But even if we somehow get into the temporary long-term permit, if you will, which is kind of a, an oxymoron, but 
uh, if ad addressing safety, uh, also address um, the appearance, uh, you know, the de design standards as well. Um, and then in terms of bureaucratic processes, how do we streamline or simplify the process to cut through any bureaucracy for these business operators? That's really, really important because we know that restaurants are still failing uh, as, as a byproduct of, of the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, the future is still uncertain in terms of um, the surges through the variants that um, are very possibly likely to occur. So how, I think we need to keep in mind that restaurants especially are continuing to struggle and we need to make it as easy as possible. Uh, and I, I would love to see that. Um, so uh, do you have a, an, an idea of, of some innovative approaches to cutting the bureaucracy and making it easier for small businesses? Thank you, uh, Council Member O'Farrell. Yes, um, I think on both of your questions, I think those are things that are, are both uh, front in our mind. Uh, to start with design standards, you're correct. We've seen a lot of other cities um, uh, move in the same pathway that we are, the city is looking at right now and the council is um, innovating. Um, and we feel the same way. We see that there is an opportunity to not only um, instill some design standards, but also use those design standards to create almost like a kit of parts so that the process could become a little bit more uh, ministerial or administrative in nature. Um, I think it depends on what people are doing on their property um, and how expansive it is. But I think, um, you know, design standards are definitely going to play a role in how we roll out a permanent program. And in terms of bureau bureaucratic process, I think the overwhelming understanding we have so far is that um, there is a desire to make it as um, streamlined as possible. And one of the things we'd like to do uh, through our process, one of the recommendations we have is, is really getting out to the business owners that are current permit holders of the temporary program to understand you know, what's working for them, what's not working for them, and, you know, what kind of process would be best. Obviously, you know, less processes would probably be the best for them, but at the same time, we need to, you know, balance the give and take of, of you know, the residents versus the business owners. But I think we're hearing loud and clear that there's a desire to see things streamlined. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. I appreciate your work on this as well. Um, I have lots of photos from my Philadelphia trip where their alfresco dining aesthetics look amazing, stunning. So um, if that could be one city at least to take a look at. And I don't know the details of what is regulated and what isn't, but it just looks really great. Uh, and then lastly, Mr. Chair, uh, to be as accommodating as possible, and, uh, and, and this is touched upon a little bit, uh, restaurants, especially in some of our secondary highways as opposed to the major boulevards uh, where they share space with residential neighborhoods. Um, there's going to be a loss of street parking. The trade-off, it's, it's shown that the trade-off works. People support fresco dining, but there has been a trade-off for loss of parking. So how do we creatively think about limiting uh, parking incursions in the residential neighborhoods as well? There, that's always, always the conflict um, are more preference, preferential parking districts perhaps part of this conversation? Are you also collaborating with DOT on some of those, some of their thoughts in terms of, of the parking uh, tensions that are going to be prevalent? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Yes, I think, you know, one of our recommendations as part of our report was that we would like to continue to coordinate and increase our coordination with all of the departments that play a role in allowing outdoor dining. And one of those departments is DOT, which actually kind of spearheaded the program early on and uh, has been taking a very active role in the on-street dining. Um, and I think part of um, the recommendation that we've provided, as well as the recommendation that um, Councilmember Blumenfield has uh, introduced as well, would go a long way in making sure that we're coordinating and, and ensuring that the program is consistent and complementary uh, between all of the departments, because we all kind of have a different role to play. 
great. If there was some some way to incentivize using public transit or bicycling uh, would be terrific. But we know that people drive cars and they drive cars to restaurants. They drive cars to destination areas, get out of their car and they go to a restaurant. So that's just the reality. But uh, any and all ideas uh, are welcome. And, and, and Mr. Chair, I, I think your recommendations are great. So so thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Uh, I know I said I was going to go to Mr. Koretz next, but Mr. Lee has a, a, an other obligation. He's going to be leaving the meeting soon. So Mr. Koretz, if you'll indulge. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Lee next so that he can get his questions answered before he has to leave. But then Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go back to you, Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It'll be really quick, uh, Paul. Um, I know there's obviously, you know, we all have parking constraints in all of our districts. So the question that gets asked to me most, will the outdoor dining portion, the new alfresco dining portion, will that count towards square footage towards parking? It depends. Currently in the code, uh, outdoor dining only um, will only trigger additional parking if it is covered um, by a roof. Um, and then it would be considered floor area, which requires additional parking. You know, as we kind of get into the process, I'm not sure exactly how things are going to um, end up with, you know, a, a permanent program. But currently, really, floor areas only can are space is only considered floor area when it has a roof on it. So if the outdoor dining is roofless, then it in the current code would not require additional parking. So if they just have sort of like some pergola or like that's considered open. It, it really depends. I mean, I, I would defer would a little bit. That? Would we set that or is that something coming down from the state or do, as a city do, can we set those standards? I'm going to defer to my colleague, um, Miss, Mr. Lara okay. with a little bit on that one. Hey, Frank. Um, Yes, good, good afternoon, Council Member. The, the structures actually do uh, require a permit, um, and, and I believe they would still be considered covered. So um, so e even though the, the somewhat casual, you know, canopies that are being placed, if they were uh, placed uh, with a permit, as they should be, um, then they would, they would be considered covered. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, we'll go now to Mr. Koretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first, I'd like to thank Pan Planning and, and Building and Safety for their work on this report and DOT for their incredible work in getting our temporary program up and running. I'm excited about the positives of this permanent program, but uh, I'm also concerned. As we transition to a permanent program, I want us to be mindful of the reality that we either mitigated or even had non-issues early in the pandemic of several of the areas that could be issues later, uh, namely uh, vehicle traffic, which was very light during the early pandemic, reduced parking needs and less pedestrian activity. So first with regards to parking requirements, um, I know I've raised this before, but the objective of the temporary program was to provide assistance for restaurants that were impacted by indoor gathering restrictions. But obviously, once COVID is passed, uh, in the long run as, under the permanent program, we'll be seeing restaurant occupancy and service expand beyond established occupancy levels, along with a reduction in available on-street parking or on-site private parking. And I'm fear of, I fear locations like Melrose where there is no residential parking, it's all permit parking. There's no additional commercial parking because there aren't tall office buildings uh, that are vacant at times to, uh, to offer additional space. Um, so there's, there's just competition for the few spaces on the street. Um, and uh, opening outdoor dining there instantly creates winners and losers. Um, so I, I am concerned. My reading of AB 61 is that the required relief from parking restrictions laid out in, in that bill is directly attached to efforts to mitigate COVID indoor dining related restrictions. So my first question is, is there any review or requirement in place as part of the existing program to ensure that there's sufficient on-site or nearby street parking 
or have all the parking requirements been waived and would be that continue to be the case post COVID? Thank you, Councilmember Kretz. Um, so under the current program, all parking regulations for restaurants are waived, um, in, including, you know, um, required on-site parking, uh, since those sites are allowing are allowed to utilize those spaces for outdoor dining. Um, Forward looking into a permanent program, I think those are considerations that demand thorough investigation and uh, a lot of research and community outreach to understand um, you know, how that is going to impact neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods, as you mentioned, that have a, a, a over, I don't want to use the word over concentration, but a very um, vibrant um, uh, restaurant and, and streetscape with a variety of users. So I think, you know, we're taking a, a calculated and thoughtful approach to determining how we want to handle the allowance for, you know, utilizing your out, your required outdoor parking or uh, your required parking for outdoor dining. I think we understand that that's going to have um, impacts on the neighborhoods, especially as you mentioned, as restaurants kind of go back to full indoor dining and, you know, the pandemic recedes in the mind and things kind of get back to somewhat what they were. Yeah, well, I, I, I hope we take a, a really close look at this. And I have some areas in my district like Westwood Village where this has really been a lifeline where they're, they're at one point was 30% occupancy and the outdoor dining places were the ones that were succeeding and, and drawing people. But uh, if, if they successfully get back and become an economic hub again with much higher occupancy, uh, suddenly they'll have much more difficulty in parking. Now, uh, it's, it, it is, is better than Melrose because there are large parking structures and you know, if all the right work is done, various cars could be directed elsewhere. Melrose, as an example, has literally nothing. Uh, no residential, no parking lots to speak of. Um, and it, it, uh, we have to be very careful in how we plan it. Um, I know we've had a couple issues in CD5 with outdoor dining structures obscuring access and sight lines to neighborhood businesses um, and, and even uh, blocking the sidewalk so that there's uh, difficult pedestrian access. Uh, in the worst cases, um, they're built with a solid roof and a solid floor and walls on three sides. So it's almost like putting a restaurant on the sidewalk. Um, you know, rather than than really an outdoor dining circumstance, which is more more akin to chairs with an umbrella out on the sidewalk. Um, and neighboring businesses are very unhappy. They're completely blocked off, no visibility at all. Uh, you really can't see them, uh, can't see their windows. Um, and in some cases, this, these structures are in front of their buildings, not in front of just the business that that needs it. So essentially there hasn't been much enforcement. We might have gone out and written the citation, but those are still there months later. Uh, much less safe than the others because there's, there's very little actual airspace um, and circulation uh, impacting neighboring businesses negatively. Is there something more dramatic that we can do? Could we uh, assess a, a several thousand dollar fine per day after they refuse to comply for a period of time. Um, could we take the outdoor dining structures and just break them down and haul them away? Um, have we looked at what our, our options are for businesses that absolutely refuse to comply? Um, you know, I think that's going to be part of our effort right now to understand how we can get people to be compliant with whatever our permanent regulations are. I think that the, the current temporary program allows for a lot of flexibility and latitude for how these outdoor dining, um, these temporary outdoor dining um, areas are designed and built out. Um, I think with a set of permanent rules and a transition to a permanent program, uh, there definitely can be a 
um, concerted effort to ensure that people are following these new rules and that some of these more egregious examples are not part of the fabric of a permanent program. Uh, that would be good. Is there any reason, though, why after many months we can't enforce more aggressively on the old ones? Because uh, I feel like our bureaucracy is actually making it more difficult to enforce and not letting us remove the places or heavily fine the places that are in violation in 10 different ways, both uh, you know, visibility and impact on neighboring businesses, but also health-wise, that they're almost as unhealthy as, as dining indoors um, because of the way they're designed. And uh, they're designed for, uh, to make business easier for themselves but not to make things safer for their patrons or their employees. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's worth us investigating that and discussing more internally about how we can handle existing operators that are using the temporary program to see if there are avenues for us to um, take actions against more egregious examples. Um, again, though, it, it is a little more difficult with the way that the temporary program is designed and how it's implemented through the, the emergency powers. Um, but I think there, there's always a opportunity for us to, you know, dig in and see what we can do. And, and do we, do we uh, communicate the parameters of the, of the existing temporary program well to people that are, are seeking to put these in currently? Um, and have during the course of the program, or are they just taking their best shot on their own? And then uh, once they find out that they're not in compliance, they just fight every way they can because they don't want to do it a second time. I believe that they are very well um, <clears throat> advertised on the site where you would apply for a permit, but the program was built with a lot of flexibility and a waiver of a lot of our regulations. So it gave a lot of, um, I don't want to say free pass, but it, it allowed for these operators to do a lot more than they would typically be allowed under our current zoning rules. So I think, you know, it, it's definitely incumbent on us as we come up with a permanent set of rules to both ensure that they uh, take into account the considerations that, that you're raising, um, as well as a, an effort to ensure that people are complying with these updated rules once they come out, or if, if necessary, going back to whatever is in the code existing right now. Well, I thank you for answering the questions. And Mr. Chair, I, I have a suggestion for uh, an additional recommendation that sort of piggybacks on things we had talked about, which would be to instruct the Department of Building and Safety and the Planning Department to report back in 60 days on the feasibility of uh, developing a suite of design options for outdoor dining structures and spaces that could just be selected by permittees and applicants in order to streamline the approval process and achieve program compliance even further uh, somewhat akin to what we do um, with ADUs, where the planning department has provided a group of different ADU designs that uh, give food for thought or, or might even just be directly submitted. So I, I thought that might be, uh, that, that, might, that makes, might be that makes, easier for uh, people to comply with if they had some easy choices. I think that makes that said it's it's very similar to uh, you know when I read the instructions at the beginning of the, the ones I was adding on, uh, and I think maybe we just tweaked the language. The one the instruction number four, which I read, was the feasibility of a program similar to the restaurant beverage program that creates a streamlined approval process for applicants to meet a series a set of standard conditions. Is that that's kind of what you're going for too, right? Well, uh, yes, yes and no because it's it's a next step more like the, the ADU process where you can go on the website and I believe there's nine different sample designs for ADUs. And one can pick one and select a, a contractor that does those designs. Um, and it's even easier. You just say, okay, I'll do that one. Yeah. So to rather than just complying, yeah. they could actually have some samples to choose from. And if they're willing to select those, they, it reduces costs, it reduces design. Yeah. 
it sounds great. It sound, it, I mean, I think we're saying the exact same thing, but to be very clear so that it's clear to them that, that we are, I mean, we're thinking the same thing for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so why, why don't we, on, on recommendation four, add that in to say feasibility program, some of the restaurant beverage program and or the ADU program creates streamlined approval process and standard uh, conditions and standard blueprints to allow, um, you know, something like that. Does that work? Yeah, or, or, or what, what I think it's considered is a, a suite of design options. So maybe that would be the most accurate. Language. All right, so why don't we, we just do a separate bullet, say the feasibility of a program like the uh, ADU to create a, a suite of design option or is that, or a suite yes. of design right. options and just include that in, instead of doing a separate day limit on that, since they're doing a report on all of these things, let's just fold that into the reports that we're getting back on, on the noise and this and that and the other, so that it's all Perfect. one. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, Mr. O'Farrell, your hand is up again. I did. I raised my head again real briefly. Uh, sure. No, no, please. Go ahead. When Mr. Lee spoke, um, he raised something that's really, really important. And um, in terms of the parking, tr triggering additional parking requirements, and, and this might be where I differ a little bit with m what Mr. Koretz said. I, I think that uh, imposing additional parking requirements should be either very, very limited because it could end up defeating the whole purpose of having this program um, or or waived under you know s very specified circumstances. For example, if it's a small restaurant with a small street frontage, and they have X amount of tables. It doesn't mean they can expand forever. And if they want to expand forever, then maybe perhaps that would trigger some sort of parking requirement. But I think this is, as a restaurant operator, if I put my feet in their shoes, I'm thinking, well, I don't know where I'm going to get another parking space or two. I can't. So I, I can't participate in the permanent alfresco program. I think I'd be really, really careful because this is a lifeline, as you said, Mr. Koretz, but uh, I'm of the view that we should be uh, very cautious in and take a look at the code again if we have to. Because if we're going to do this, I certainly don't want to then have some sort of self-defeating requirement that helped this fly in the first place given that parking requirements were waived. Should it be the wild west out there where structures are blocking signs or harming the business next door? Absolutely not. That's where the design standards come in. But to help the restaurant establishments specifically, uh, I get a little nervous when I hear that their additional parking requirements could be imposed. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kretz, your, your hands up. Did you want to respond or do you have another question? Okay, um, and I, I think old hands. I just didn't take it down. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, and I, I think with the way that, that that I framed the recommendations, it's not prescriptive on that. It's it, again, it's going to say, considering the follow con, to to get the report back, the status report on the recommendations, considering parking issues, including an evaluation of corridors with high concentration of outdoor dining, uh, increased capacity in relation to parking availability. So I think that gives. The department flexibility to come back with some rational proposals. Do you in the department need more direction from us on this issue? Or are you comfortable uh, moving forward at this point uh, on this parking issue, Mr. Pennington or anyone else? Lillian Rubio for planning. Um, we're comfortable with the language you provided to move along. Okay. Obviously, this is this is the first step. We're gonna, the devil is always in the details and and we may not all agree on those details, but at least we're going to move forward uh, to get those details so we can discuss them. So seeing no further comments or questions, uh, I'm going to recommend that we uh, adopt the recommendations in the joint DCP LADBS report dated November 17th, 2021, with the following amendments. Again, amend instruction three, instruct the Department of City Planning, the Department of Building and Safety, the Department of Transportation, the Bureau of Engineering, and other applicable departments to develop a set of proposed regulations and processes which are consistent and complementary for permanent alfresco and outdoor dining program. To add the instructions that I read earlier, if you need to, I can read them again, but I think you may have them, including the additional one that Mr. Koretz put forward. Um, about the feasibility of a program similar to the ADU with a set of standard design, what do we call it, design concepts, which 
which I think it's embodied in what we're saying, but to spell that out. Uh, is that clear, Mr. Espinosa, or do I need to read anything further? No, I believe um, everything is clear. Uh, in that case, we can take a vote. Thank you. Council Member Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Council Member Lee? Council Member Lee is absent. Council Member De Leon? I believe Council Member De Leon is absent right now. Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. And Council Member Kretz? Aye. That is three ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's move to item number two. Um, if you would please read that into the record. Thank you. Item number two is a report from the city administrative officer relative to the Innovation and Performance Commission Innovation Fund funding for the resilient solar powered street lights project from the Bureau of Street Lighting. Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. DeLeon is here. Um, I, can, I guess I'll move to reconsider item uh, item one so Mr. DeLeon can vote on it, seeing no objections. Uh, if you could read the roll and we will uh, vote again on item one. Thank you. This is for the reconsideration of item number one, Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Lee. Council Member Lee is absent. Council Member DeLeon. Aye. Council Member O'Farrell. Aye. And Council Member Kretz. Aye. That is four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for your consideration. Absolutely. Um, so let's move to item number two again. You just read it into the record. Uh, so, and, and this is this is an important issue. We've had such uh, issues with copper theft has just been going out of control, and, and uh, obviously the idea of doing something with solar that is in the entire, the top of the light fixture as opposed to the traditional solar that's in the bottom makes a lot of sense. I know we have some grants already moving in that direction, but uh, let's let's get the report from the from our presenters. I think we have CAO and BSL. Um, Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, council members, my name is Melissa Velasco with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. I'll kick us off for this particular item. Uh, so the Innovation and Performance Commission is recommending an award of $200,000 from the Innovation Fund for the Bureau of Street Lighting. The Bureau would use these funds to procure at least 50 of a new type of solar-powered resilient street light. These street lights would be an integrated fixture, an all-in-one fixture with the solar panels included at the top of the light fixture and the battery bank located within the pole um, for the solar power. The Bureau hopes that this type of street light would help with three different really important uh, departmental priorities. One you just mentioned, which is to reduce city costs associated with copper wire theft, as uh, these type of lights would not require copper wire. The second would be to address sustainability goals by adding additional solar powered infrastructure to the Bureau's inventory of street lights. And the third would be to increase resiliency of the city's street lighting infrastructure by allowing these light fixtures to continue to work during storms or other incidents that may normally affect the power distribution grid. And I'm joined by Miguel Sanglang, the general manager of the Bureau of Street Lighting, and we're happy to answer any questions the committee members have. Sorry. Mr. Sanglang, do you want to add anything before we get started? No, I'm happy to answer any questions, though. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions just to get us started. So where will the solar powered lights be deployed for the pilot or how, or I should say, how are the locations going to be chosen? Definitely we're, we're trying to disperse it across the city uh, to give us the best kind of picture example. Uh, we've, we've already worked with uh, some of your council offices actually to, to work on a few pilots uh, before this one even came uh, along the LA river. Um, to which we've seen a uh, great kind of improvement and ability for us to light it and, and have to avoid kind of going back being repeat customers for copper wire and theft there. Um, so we would like to try and expand it throughout the city. Again, we're, we're open to any locations, anyone that would like us to try it, um, we're happy to take uh, intake. Uh, and actually joined with me right now is Eddie Chavez, our head of infrastructure protection at the Bureau. Um, who is trying to organize all of that. But uh, really, we, we, we want to try it in the Valley because of the, the types of streets that we have there. 
uh, we, we want to try it along the coast and, and uh, more central in the, the city as well. And I think uh, the one piece that I would differentiate, because as uh, I mentioned, there are some grants that, and, and you have uh, as well, Chair, that there are some grants that we're going for. Uh, now, we, we really want to start looking at this for our residential streets um, and surface streets so, um, uh, so that we can test to see if it'll work for, for everyday purposes. And, and that's what makes, that's why this is an innovation. I mean, because it's, obviously there's the, beg, it begs the question, if we're already doing it, why is it an innovation grant? But I take it that that's part of the reason is because we're testing it for a variety of uses and, uh, and that kind of thing. There's no question that it's an important thing. The question is, why is it, why is it worthy of outside of the budget funding through innovation? Maybe I just answered the question for you. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, that absolutely. Uh, so we also uh, hope that this will feed into our proposals as we talk about the budget. So anything that we learn as we deploy these pilots throughout the city um, will be things that we would like to bring to bear. Uh, if it works, great. We would love to show it. If it doesn't work, we didn't, uh, you know, waste precious dollars in the budget. Uh, for us, that would go towards other programs that might have been proven. You know, one of the things that gets me very excited about this too, I mean, there's a lot of really good things about this, but is it possible if it's successful, it could also allow us to expand where street lighting is? Right now, when a constituent asks for light and there's no light and it wasn't put in the development, it's very expensive to get new lighting. Um, but if this is successful, is it possible that the standalone solar lighting could make it less expensive for property owners to add street lights where they currently don't exist? Uh, it will it will depend on a couple aspects whether there are places for us to actually attach it. So some of the things that we've been seeing uh, is that it can be attached to, to buildings in addition to the regular poles. Um, I think the cost of capital of putting the pole, erecting a pole, uh, so that we're able to attach it on there is one of the more cost prohibitive things. Uh, but that's also why we're going aggressively for many types of different grant funding, especially in disadvantaged communities. Um, we are trying to. Uh, make it as equitable as possible when we're approaching infrastructure. But it is it is a possibility, right? If we are not paying as much to create the electrical system itself, um, there's just other costs when it comes to foundations and poles themselves. Right. I, I always imagined that a big part of the cost wasn't just the pole and the foundation, but was running the power to that pole. So if you don't have to run the power to the pole, then then you've cut out a big chunk of it, it would seem. Um, but yeah. Absolutely. And and those new services are things that we would have to work with DWP, right? Um, and some of the things that we would be uh, having to uh, expand with for, for their network. So uh, many different kind of things that we're streamlining if we're able to go this direction. And and the cost, the, the cost of solar power fixtures relative to a standard fixture the Bureau would typically install, is it more or less, are there cost savings in these fixtures themselves? like avoiding the cost of wiring, or is it solely in the power consumption and, and obviously the maintenance of not having to replace stolen copper wire every other week? Right. Uh, the fixtures themselves are considerably more expensive. So in comparison to our standard um, light fixture that we would buy, uh, this is probably 10 times more expensive. Uh, so, so that might come as a stocking, uh, shocking sticker price, uh, I do equate it very much to, you know, switching from uh, uh, CFL bulbs to L uh, or uh, traditional incandescent to then LEDs, right? You, you have a larger upfront payment. You have energy savings, though, uh, in the long run. Um, the other aspect, though, that I really highlight where it, it's beyond just energy savings that we would be uh, able to recreate is the fact that we, we're paying so much on materials. We're paying so much on labor uh, in order to bring lights back to where it's been stolen, right? So uh, one incident uh, specifically on the LA River where we have had um, a repeat situation, um, wires that were stolen twice, uh, cost upwards of around $20,000. Uh, and that was just to repair about eight lights. Um, for a little bit more, we would have been able to uh, place these solar lights and then not ever had to go back there again. So I think those are some of the cost savings that we'll see. Um, so despite the upfront capital costs and higher cost of the fixture itself, saves much more on uh, maintenance and, and longer kind of uh, regular uh, costs for us. That's great. Uh, Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Sangalog. I'm going to just illustrate for, for people at the LA River. So when, when we did the, the, 
the jogging and walking path implementation. In 2011, I was on the staff of my predecessor and it was one of my projects. All of the copper wire was immediately stolen um, because it was kind of a standard protective plate over the installation, the lights. And I can say this now all these years later, but it cost the city $400,000 to replace that system. Now, here's how determined these copper wire thieves are. So at that time, when we replaced it uh, again, we had them pour cement slabs over all of the boxes. So they have, they have since begun, the thieves then more recently went in and started jackhammering the cement slab so they could still get at the copper wire. So there is such profound determination for these copper wire thieves to steal the copper wire. So who knows how, how much longer we can harden the targets because there's such determination in places like the LA River when there are long periods of time when perhaps there aren't any eyes and ears on things. Uh, it's, it makes it really easy. So this innovative, uh, any innovation in how we can just perhaps bypass the need of copper wire would be a good thing. My only, uh, so one question, and that is, we also have our EV chargers uh, at approximately 400 uh, locations within light poles. Uh, has that been affected? And, and can perhaps some of this innovation be placed at at some of these light poles where there are EV chargers? Right, that, that's, a, that's a great question, especially since we're looking to expand the larger EV infrastructure uh, to, to match with all of the, the federal and state and our, even our local uh, goals there. So um, the, the battery technology we've been seeing change dramatically recently. Uh, and so, you know, our hope that in the longer term, we'll, able to, we'll be able to do more um, that is uh, battery enabled and, and, and able to uh, protect our infrastructure in different ways. Uh, right now, it's a little bit too nascent. So um, in those situations, we're going to require heavily on um, hard wire still, um, but we're going to try and harden it as best we can. We're working with our partners in the uh, Department of Water and Power to make sure that we're, we're thinking about the gas station of the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments from colleagues on this item? No, uh, not seeing any. I'm going to recommend that we approve the recommendation in the CAO report. Uh, Mr. Espinosa, if you could uh, read the call the roll, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Lee. Oh, Councilmember Lee is absent. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember O'Farrell. Aye. And Councilmember Koretz. Aye. That is four ayes, and this item is approved. Great. Does that clear the desk? The desk is clear, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, then, thank you very much. This meeting is officially adjourned. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>